a lot of people say, well, I know all about the cross. Well, if we knew all about the cross, life would be very awesome. If we knew all about the cross, life would be very different. If we knew all about the cross, our shadows would be taking care of some business. If we knew all about the cross, the hospital would be being emptied out. If we knew all about the cross, everyone in our family and everybody on the workplace and everywhere we went would be saved. If we knew all about the cross, people would see and know we're an ambassador of God. And when we stepped in the place and every place we put our feet, it's conquered ground. It's already been ours. It's already, it's already been given to us. And this, this is our inheritance. So I pray that really that, that instead of doing what we do in church, which is kind of, kind of here, but not really try to apply. Instead, I want everything that's said to figure out where it can land in the, create a landing pad for it in your life. Don't think about your neighbor, your wife, your kids. Just try to ask the Lord, how can I understand this mystery of the cross so that I can get to a place where you open up realities and revelations and mysteries that I can see so clearly? You know, when, um, when Jesus talks about, you know, if, if someone slaps you on the cheek, give them the other. Do you know how many church people I've heard say, he doesn't really mean that. The same guy that hung on a cross, he doesn't really mean that. The same guy that took nails, the same guy that took lashes for my healing, the same guy that was bruised for my iniquity, the same guy who beard was pulled out and they said, prophesy, prophet, who just pulled your beard out? Who just smit you? And that guy, he said, yeah, he, he didn't mean it. He didn't mean turn the other cheek. No. Nah. That's kind of silly, right? When you think about Jesus and then you think about the word of God, we usually try to figure out how we can find a happy medium that doesn't make us responsible. Is it getting too heavy? I'm just getting started. The mystery of the cross, I believe, is one of the greatest mysteries of the word of God. Because here's the deal. Jesus said in Luke 9, he says, To all of them, if any wishes to come after me, some versions, some places, he says, to be my disciple. How many people want to be a disciple of Jesus? A disciple. There's a lot of hands not up. I, I don't really know that if you're not a disciple, you'll go to heaven, but I hope so. I'm just saying, like, I don't really know where the line's drawn. All I know is that he endures to the end saved and, you know, and, and also that he's married to the backslider. So I don't know where the line's drawn. I just know that I want to run hard. I'm going for it all. Because here's the worst thing that could happen. Like, I die a worthless life, end up right in front of the throne room of God, and he said, dude, did you see how much was in your vault that was wide open all your life, sitting there waiting on you to access it? And you were too cowardice, self-focused to even say, hey, this, is, this life isn't about me. What's in here? That access is granted already. It's already fully available. And what happens is, is we, we, we say, like, I don't know, disciple sounds a little tough. Maybe I'll just feel like, a, you know, saved is good. Um, you know, interesting that Jesus oftentimes put Savior with the word, another word. It's called Lord. And Savior. Lord's different than Savior, wouldn't you say? Master is a good word for Lord. Master. This guy was praying in India, and it just struck my heart. He kept praying, Master, I love you. Master, come and just touch people's lives. He's just saying, Master, Master, Master. And every time he said it, I was like, that's heavy, man. I love that. Because here's the deal. We live in a culture that says it's all about me. I got freedom, man, freedom, American way, freedom, yeah, and then at the end of the day, what am I free to do, what am I free to be, am I free from me, because the real problem is I'm not free from me, I ain't free from, at all, 
The reality is, I hate being bound to me. So I'm not going to be talking to you. I'm going to be talking with you. I'm very, very familiar with a lot of different aspects of the cross, and I'll try to bring a lot of balance. It should bring a lot of hope because so much is paid for and provisioned to you. And what happens is we end up living a life, and we don't even know what's available. The, the enemy's domain is darkness. Ignorance is the best way to say it. If there's ignorance in your life, you will not have access and you will be a victim in that area. You could be like Billy Graham status, amazing speaker, and be jacked up in three other areas that, that ignorance reigns. That's why Christians, see, I, people like really have a hard time. They, especially if you call yourself a leader, then they're like, oh, the standards are here. I get it. We should all be desiring to have high standards. I get that. But also, do any of us remember that sometimes people don't know who they are in an area? And the fact that you see what they should be, you should be calling them what they should be instead of calling them what they are. See, a lot of times we're so judgmental, we just act as the enemy's tool and say, oh, look at you. This is what you are. It's like, that's not what God said they are. And if they have a deficit, God has said they're usually, if you could pour into that area, if you could realize that I saw this because God trusted me with this information. God trusted me around this situation. Say these guys, they're doing marriage counseling for other people, but say they had a rough day. And I was like, God, you trust me with this information. Or do I say, the Currys, maybe they shouldn't be doing ma marriage class. And I go around like, whoa, I don't know. They weren't getting along too good. I, maybe they've been doing too much counseling, and now it's just overwhelmed them. And then I'm like, I'm setting up a case against them. Instead of calling them up and saying, I'm here for you, with you, to love you. That's what we're supposed to be all about. I believe that's what we are all about. But I like to make you think, because all of us have to make that individual assessment. Is that what you're all about? Because that's really what Redemption House aspires to be all about. And we're, we, we will fail you. <laughs> we will let you down. We will not be perfect all the time. I'm absolutely positive, especially if it has anything to do with me. Because here's the deal, right? I'm one guy, and I'm not Jesus. Now, I aspire to be like Jesus. I don't make excuses to not be like Jesus. I have the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, and I'm not going to bow to a lower standard, even if I had a bad day. The next day, it's time to dust off, and the righteous man, though he falls seven times, guess what? He knows how to get back up and put on his big boy pants. Sometimes we need to learn how to not wallow. You know what wallowing is? Wallowing's what pigs do. And when, sheep's, when sheep get dirty, they feel, they feel yucky. They feel like, I got to get this off of me. Pigs love it. And you know, pigs are actually synonymous with heathen or Gentiles. And so, you know, the, the, the demons that went into the pigs and the pigs ran off the, even the Gentiles don't like demons. They just ran right off the cliff. They thought they got a new host and the host got baptized. <laughs> so, now, Jesus says, if anyone comes after me, or wants to be my disciple, other places say. He must deny himself, take up his cross daily. Everybody say daily. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Okay? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So a lot of times we think following Jesus is just as easy as like, Jesus, I follow you. Well, you can't start the following process on step three. 
You can't start the car off in third gear. You have to start the car off in first gear. And if first thing's not first, then you can't go to third. Okay? This isn't rocket science. I, I promise y'all are looking at me like I'm speaking Chinese. But this is actually straightforward. First is you have to first deny yourself. If you want to get where Jesus has for you, if you want to get to the vault, if you want to get to abundant life and all the promises that we claim over ourselves, you have to first. And that's tough because I like to claim promises even that I'm not in position for. Then I get frustrated and sometimes, it's been a while, it's been a while, but I'm trying to think when the last time I blamed God, now I kind of take a lot more ownership. I used to blame God like, hey, buddy, you know, you said this in your word. And he's kind of like, you know, if I threw the football at you right now, it hit you in the back of the head. It would look pretty silly. You know, sometimes what we think we're ready for, if God dropped it on you, it would destroy you. I believe that finances are one of those key areas. I, I've heard the Lord say, I want to do so much more, but I need you to be prepared. Preparation for where you're at is everything for what's coming. If you want what's coming, you have to be prepared. So you first deny yourself. You take up your cross. Okay? And then you follow Jesus. Then you're in, thir then you're in third gear. So... Jesus typically uses the cross as an illustration of denying oneself. This is Jesus' life, guys. My life, Jesus says, is not my own. Jesus. Do you, we, we superhero Jesus because we like to superhero everybody because it gives us room for gap, room for error, even permission sometimes. But the reality is Jesus left earth, destroyed hell, came to earth, and left earth to send us that same Holy Spirit which dwells on the inside of him back to us. He says, it's better that I don't sit here and keep ministering to you. What if what I have, I give you? Remember when we were praying and we had the prayer meeting and I was bleeding through my pores and I came, guys, guys, can't you pray an hour? And I'm bleeding through my forehead. I'm bleeding out my pores. And y'all are like, I'm trying. Like, real awesome, guys. What a prayer team. Glad you've been with me three and a half years. I really feel like I've poured in. Like, that's, that's sometimes how it is. Because what I'm learning is that the most important thing we can ever give anyone is that same Holy Spirit that dwell in Christ Jesus. If we don't take people to that Holy Spirit, you will stay in trouble a long, 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 long time. Because you weren't made to be victorious. God was victorious. And God wants to dwell and is dwelling on the inside of you. So we start waking up to that reality that I have a spirit man. That's a new creation. That's alive in me. And he's going to war for you. And guess what? He is going to win. I don't know if you get it. That same Holy Spirit that's linked up with your new creation spirit is going to win the war. He doesn't care if it's going to cost you and you're going to need to be a prison minister. He doesn't care how it takes. He's going to win. I know it. I've seen it. God is faithful to complete the work that he started in me and in you. Amen? He started a good work in me, and he that started a good work is faithful and just to complete it until the day of his coming. He wants to see the fullness that he paid for. He wants to see what he paid for in you. He's looking for dividends. You know, I, I love the, the story about the uh, talents. Five two, and one. He distributes it and says, I want you to use this. And then he goes away. Then he comes back and says, how did you do? Now, if Jesus was in America preaching, that would not be a good parable, nor would it be fair. Because the guy with one only has one. Why would you take from the guy that's only got one? 
See, because we think our thinking is okay, Jesus says, I'm going to take from the guy that has one and give it to the guy who's productive that has five. If you're constantly finding yourself spiraling downhill, it's because poor stewardship has led you to the place you're at. Okay? If it's marriage and you're on number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, there's a stewardship problem. You're like, courting, and then you're like, I do. And then after that, you're like, hey, woman, if I ever change my mind, I said I love you once. If I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. It's not going to work well. If we poorly steward areas of our life, there's an ignorance factor that the enemy has full rights to. So we have to say, God, what does, what does stewardship look like in this area? What does stewardship look like in a marriage? What does stewardship look like in, in, a, in a, a thrift store? What does stewardship look like in a church? What does stewardship look like in a family? We start asking tough questions because Holy Spirit's a genius. The main reason we don't know is because we don't ask. He's a genius. I remember I was, I was working like diligently. I started saying, this is really weird. I will work six hours on a problem all day long, and I'm stuck, stuck, stuck. And it's very frustrating when you're stuck, 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 and you're supposed to know what you're doing. It's very frustrating. I mean, if you have, like, an area of expertise, and you're like, I know this stuff. You know it so well that you forget to ask your friend who's the genius. That's the problem. (laughs) So he likes to teach sometimes. So he's like, oh, you got it. Yeah, man. Get it. Get her done. And I I almost, like, toward, toward a little while in, I'm like, okay, wise guy. Wise guy. Mr. Wise Guy, Mr. Wisdom, what is the answer? Now, this is how it works, and this is why some people don't think they hear from God. About three minutes later, after I've been working on a six-hour problem, maybe two minutes, I just get this brilliant idea. All of a sudden, I'm a genius. I'm like, watch out. This is what I was, this is what, I see, I'm back, I'm back on track. I knew it. I knew I had this. See, I didn't need you. No, just kidding. I would not, I wouldn't say that, but but if we don't understand our relationship and the depths of the power that's in Christ Jesus, we sit there and we walk a walk so blind, so weak, so feeble, that if someone blows too hard and you're like, ah, you know, teetering over and 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 frail and 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 we're having trouble and 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 storms come and, and our house is like built on sand. It's not okay. Jesus said it's not okay. It's a catastrophe when we don't shore up our foundation on the rock. On the rock. So I talked about being a disciple. So that's, that's actually what Jesus typically talked about because he knew that his life was not his own. And it was so important to him that his life was not his own that he constantly was saying, guys, watch me. And take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden's light. You know why his yoke's easy and his burden's light? Because Holy Spirit's doing all the work. And all he's got to do is put his head in and look like a genius. That's a good deal all day long. But instead, like most Christians are like, oh, I'm really going through it. I'm warring. It's like, why are you warring? I thought that the Bible says that the battle is not mine, says the Lord, actually. Says the Lord, actually. Not my, that's not, the battle is not yours, says the Lord. If you can remember the battle's not mine, why am I fighting? T.D. Jakes used to preach a message that says, um, never fight battles where there are no spoils. <laughs> most people fight the most battles on things they don't even have control over. That's the greatest mystery of them all. Think about it. How much time do you spend worrying about things you can't even do anything about? You know how many times I've tried to fix things I can't even control? When I try to fix things I can't control, I spend all this energy on stuff that's completely out of my reach. And when I try to do that, I end up 
in this worn out state because I didn't ask the Lord, what am I supposed to be doing with my time right now? I got lost in something I didn't even have control over. And so you learn to say, your yoke's easy. Your burden's light. I give this to you. Here, I give this to you. And it's that easy. I'm done. Like, we're not even going to talk about it anymore. The battle's yours. The problem's yours. I gave it to you. Holy Spirit, you got it. We're not going to talk about it anymore. No That's how I overcome fear. I'm not Superman. I have fears like anyone else. I just learned this goes to you. It's false evidence appearing real. It's not even likely going to happen. So since it's not even likely going to happen, how much time should I spend on it? <laughs> right? So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, it says, For Christ sent me not, this is Paul speaking, he sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom, lest the cross of Christ, that it should be of none, made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross, listen carefully, guys. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to the, those of us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So, here God comes up with this amazing, this amazing passage. It's basically saying, the more I count on saying wise things as if it has something to do with how well I articulate, how well I put things together, how well I can say things, if I could be, try really nice to say the right things to somebody, Listen, you can try all day long to be the nicest person you ever could be, to be the nicest spouse you ever could be, to be the nicest parent, co-worker, whatever area you're struggling in, okay? And here's the, at the end of the day, it is not your wisdom, it is not your might, it is not your power, it is by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. If the Lord wants to fight your battle, I think it's time to back up. I got this. I got this. Right? So I got this, this amazing um, passion right now about, about making sure that people run well, that we're building champions here. It's like never before. I, I'm so serious about it. If, you, if you've talked to me within the last two weeks, you've at least heard me. Well, if you've been around me, you've heard me say a lot. Just in this last couple of days, I, I've, like, been spending time Counseling anyone that's around me, I just, boom, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk. And we got to get serious, guys. People are dying, and people are struggling, people are wounded, and they think, they think it's like God trying to teach them something. When half the time, they're fighting battles they're not supposed to be in. Half the time, they're working against the wind when the wind's saying, go over here. It's like our ignorance is killing us. It's causing us to overwork ourselves. Frustration is not a fruit of the Spirit. And if you have frustration regularly in your life, you are not walking by the Spirit. If, you, if you're struggling constantly to have a good day, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Guess where the joy abides? In His presence. Fullness. If you're not full, if you're not filling up, guess what? I know when the tank's running low. And it happens. It happens. It happens to me. I don't know if it happens to Tracy. It happens to me. I run out because sometimes I go running on empty. I'm not going to sing that song either. But I just, I just like life sometimes, you know. I get it. That does not bring excuse into my reality. I can't say, well, you know. The last two days have just been crazy. So I can act any way I want. No, i got to remind myself that if the dummy light is on the dashboard saying, feed me, feed me, feed me. Oh, that's that thing called uh, my spirit man. Yeah. Hey, buddy, what you been up to? Oh, I see you've been dying a little while. No wonder you feel you look all decrepit and 
and pathetic. Uh, you know, if you want the right dog to win, you've got to feed the right one. Whichever, if it's a dog fight, you've got to feed the one that you want to win. If you feed your flesh, the flesh is going to win the battle. No, <laughs> I know you do. No, ma'am. I'd, th- I'd have to think too hard. Oh, no, you can't. <laughs> she would try, but I know it would, it would go. So- <laughs> well, you're a, you are my better half. Anytime we are co-pastors of this wonderful church. You can always, you can always lead this church. Yeah. I'm being serious because here's the thing, guys. We don't want anymore to act like um, we're supposed to be one, right? And then sometimes, like, we leave pastors' wives way out in the dirt somewhere, just struggling in the background. Well, maybe you guys don't know what I'm talking about, and that's okay. But they struggle because they're so, they're so, like, everybody, the, all the, all, all kinds of people, like, women will talk to their husbands. I had, my old pastor said that a woman said, you're not supposed to be with your wife, you're supposed to be with me. An intercessor. And, and she said that because the pastor liked intercessory prayer. But that doesn't mean he's your husband now. Just saying. That might hurt your wife if you're a pastor. You know, it's things like that that sometimes we got to, like, we got to get a grip and say, like, this is real stuff that happens because, but see, here's what happens. Everybody faults the woman for her deception. But here's the problem. Who's going to help her? See, I'm not any longer trying to figure out whose fault it is. I'm trying to figure out how to solve impossible problems that the world's facing so that the world can know there's a God. See, it's a very different world when we start thinking, what are you facing and how can I kill this thing for you? Or how can we do it together? How can we work this out? How can I even help? How can I just love you? If I can't help, can I at least love you? Let you know that God cares. You know? And, um... As we're, as we're thinking about the cross, it says that as we start thinking of, of our own wisdom and we try to tell people, like, you know, when we start going, like, I need to get the right words to be able to speak to people and evangelize. When you say that, you're actually saying that the cross isn't powerful enough by itself. It needs your help. Like, I need, like, God, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable right now because, because you know why you're not comfortable? Because you don't do it. Is that revelation? I just seen revelation right there. If, if, If you're not comfortable telling somebody about Jesus, it's not because you don't know how. It's because you don't do it. Because once you do it, you will be completely hooked on the fact that you're a genius because that's who God was trying to talk to. And sometimes you'll find out he wasn't trying to talk to that one. But that's okay. It's part of the process. If you want to learn God's voice, if you want to stop going in the wrong direction in life, my sheep, John 10, know my voice, and a stranger they don't follow. You know how you learn the, the Father's voice? By going out of the boat. <laughs> like, you've got to get out of the boat. You can't be, like, doing as little as possible in the spirit realm. I heard Andrew Womack this week say, he must have said 25 times, by the way, you're carnal. (laughs) He said, da-da-da, and if this is you, you're carnal. Da-da-da-da-da-da, and if this is you, you're carnal. And I was like, man, this guy's hardcore. And he he was speaking in London, and uh, what he was saying that really touched me, he says, carnal doesn't mean like you're a fleshly, horrible person. It means you're governed by five senses. You're governed by what data comes in from the world. You're governed by what you see, what you smell, what you hear. You're governed by external things instead of the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord wants to build relationships with us, but we, here's, here's what he said. If you get prayed for for healing and you need to feel that you're healed, you're carnal. 
Because the word of God is true whether you feel it or not. And so I was like, ah, this hurts. So I'm excited about you going. And uh, that, that, guy's, that guy's amazing. Um, so we, don't, we, don't, we want to raise up people that are in tune with their spirits. He, he said this, if, if, you, if I ask, how are you feeling today? Everybody could tell me how they're feeling. If I ask you, what do you hear? What do you see right now? You could tell me what you see, what you feel. You could tell me uh, how was your week. You could tell me what you're going through. You could tell me everything that's going on with your soul. You could tell me everything that's going on in your body. You could tell me all the sensory data. But you can't tell me how's your spirit man today. Completely and totally disconnected from the reality that God wants to show us. And then we wonder why is, is it not so victorious? It's really easy, guys. The cross has opened a way, and the enemies told us, nah, it's more than that. You gotta work on this thing. You gotta struggle a while longer. You gotta be saved at least 10 years. You gotta be a pastor, or you gotta, you know, you gotta be something you're not. All, all the enemy wants to do is make sure whatever you're waiting for, th- that you're not that. Whenever you get that, you'll not be the next thing so that you can still not have what God said you had already. It's constantly pushing out the envelope, pushing the carrot a little farther so I can't quite have the abundant life, the the abundant life God promised. Guess what? You have the abundant life God promised even if you don't use it. Isn't that a crazy thought? You have the abundant life that God promised, and you have a new creation living on the inside, even if you don't know him. Your spirit man. Your spirit man. The guy who God foreknew before you were in your mother's womb, before he knit you together, before he started planting things, and before the world got a hold of you. He foreknew you. And that guy's completely disconnected from this this computer guy, this computer brain. He's like, all I know is like what I sense and what I feel and oh, they hurt my feelings and now I'm hurt. Your spirit man's not hurt. He's having a great day. You should get in touch. You should re- reach out and touch your spirit. Man or woman, I, I don't like to be genderless, but I'll do it for you. So to be of none effect is literally, think about the power of that. The cross of Christ will become none effect when we start thinking and applying our own wisdom to what God wants to do. When we start saying, no, no, I got this. See, I, I'm telling you, the most dangerous places in your life are the ones you think you got it. Because you, you can get in deception there even easier. You know, um, I, I'm going to keep going, actually. Um, so in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, it says, and my speech was, and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but demonstration of the spirit and of power. The, the goal of Holy Spirit is to make you so big, no one will even believe it's you. That's his goal. His goal is to get glory from you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's actually looking for his investment to be returned to him. He's a master investor. He invested a son into the earth, into the belly of the earth, and he's seeing all over the globe many sons pop up. And he's looking for your sonship to be reality to you. Your sonship to be a reality to you. So it's the Bible here says that the, the cross, listen carefully to this, the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. When I talk about denying yourself, some people literally hit the off button in their hearing right away. They're not trying to hear that. Here's the problem. If you weren't made for you and you keep trying to do you, excuse me for my slang, you keep trying to live for yourself. I'm going to be up these way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> If you're trying to live for yourself, what happens, what happens when we're trying to live for ourselves is we break the very thing that God made us. We break the very thing that God made us. He made us in his image. Guess what we're made to do? We're not only just, besides just saying it's simple, we're made to love. 
Okay, that's really simple. I'm made to love. I am actually made to be an extension of the Godhead in the earth. God actually wants to reach through me and touch lives. You know the song about being Jesus' hands, being Jesus' feet, being Jesus' voice? That's what God expects. And the Bible actually says that's our reasonable service, is to be completely sold out. I'm saying that it's not even about, like, at least learn what you're missing before you continue in the wrong direction. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Would that be a good idea? Like, what if, what if you were missing the most amazing ride of your life because you want to be on the Scooby-Doo roller coaster? I know. That wasn't a jab, honey. I'm just saying, if, you, if that's all you want in life is a Scooby-Doo. There's a Batwing. There's a Superman. There's some much better things in life. And God wants... God wants to do greater things in your life. God wants to do greater things in your life, but you have to actually allow him by getting out of the way. Like, the battle's not yours. Real simple stuff. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit, says the Lord. Thank you, honey. Okay, I'm going to have to close on this. I think I was almost halfway through. (laughs) Ah. See, this is, uh, I had so much because I was only doing one service. I like Greek and all this good stuff. You can, of course. That, I'm really looking forward to this because um, this is the first time I think I can really honestly say that my husband has more time now, um, which is amazing. His job is only requiring 40 hours a week. Oh. So I, I, I with no travel, with, with no travel no praise Jesus, cover it in the blood. And, and, and a lot of it is he work does. from home. Right so, so I feel like, like, like I'm sitting here and like my body's trembling trem- like, because I feel like, um, like I feel like the plane is getting ready to just go. Shoo. I mean, I don't know if you can sense through his um, fired up through his speaking, being in the presence. And, and, and I mean, he was counseling till, um I was so upset last night. You want to talk about frustrated? Three o'clock in the morning, he's talking with someone that he loves on the front porch still. I'm like, <laughs> so, 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 like all weekend, he's been counseling, like constantly. And then I'm sitting here thinking, oh man, the tables are turning. <laughs> but it's so good. I'm preaching. Are you done? Yes. Sure. All right. Can you guys give my wife a hand? I'm not. I mean, I, that was good. I get it. <laughs> I got to end on this, and uh, this is really important. How many people have ever read Genesis 1, 2, and 3? And I'm not going to be reading about the seed-bearing herbs, if that's your justification. Don't worry. Don't worry. I learned that in high school. That was Cypress Hill before you knew it. Yes, back in the day. Yeah. Um, but I got delivered. Hallelujah. All right. Oh, I am going to be talking about trees, though. Hmm. There were two trees in the garden. There were two trees in the garden. Garden. Garden of Eden. Come on back. Come on back, my people. So there's the Garden of Eden. There were two trees in the Garden of Eden. These two trees were in the midst of the garden, right? The Lord made the trees, all the trees, and the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden. And then it goes on to say, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is in the midst of the garden. He made both of them. And then, uh, interesting, um, he said, you shall not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we're talking about the cross here. So I don't want you to lose context. Okay? I don't want you to eat from that tree. God has a reason that's much bigger than your desire to eat it. You should probably figure out what his reason is for you being crucified with Christ, for you taking up your cross, for you denying yourself. There's a much bigger reason 
the catastrophic effects of Adam and Eve's sin, we've all been blaming them since. But the reality is, God has made a way for us to not walk in their sin. God has made the crooked place straight for us to not have an excuse. I know we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity, but we were born again, right? Okay, if we were born again, then we can actually make that straight path, a beamline to the destiny God has for us. So these two trees are in the midst of the garden, and one we're not allowed to eat of, and the other one we can. And then the enemy comes off with this. Will you surely die? Like, you're not going to surely die. He didn't mean like dead, dead. Like you're not like heart attack, keel over dead. Don't worry, you can eat it. See, the enemy's pretty slick because I was really worried about really dying, but now that it's just like kind of dead, that's not so bad. Let me tell you something. I would rather be physically dead than some of the paths I walked in life. Even after Christ, okay? Sometimes... There is a much lower place, and it's worse when you know the beloved and you're in Babylon. See, you came through the Red Sea, you crossed on over into the promised land, and the promised land's amazing, grapes the size of your head, houses you didn't build, amazing things, the lender, I'm going to be the lender, not the borrower, promises galore. And then you're like, well, these guys, they don't seem that bad, do I really have to get rid of them? Come on, Dan said it was okay. Dan is a guy in the tribes. Sorry, it wasn't Dan. Uh, There were only two tribes that didn't actually compromise. Out of those two tribes, those were the two that didn't become Samaritans. The ten fell away and became Samaria. The two, Judah and Benjamin, Stayed pure to the edict. Everybody know edict like law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is do not let anyone live in the land I'm giving you. Anyone. And everybody's like, that's so harsh. If we were, if we were, if we were taking over, we would definitely be Samaria. Because we'd be like, oh, they're so cute. And look, they have a lot of stuff. Think of how much they can help. We can work together. Can't we all get along? And we're reasoning this thing out, and God's like, kill it. That's the option in that's the option in the scripture. Kill it. Dead. It's coming after you. It's going to destroy you. It's going to sweep you away, and you won't even know it. Kill it. You think God is hates them? No, he knows their decision ahead of time, and he's trying to protect you as one of his. It's not about, like, I get it. I want to minister to people. I, somebody said, like, they were ministering somewhere stupid, and I was like, yeah, I was in the crack house earlier, and, you know, I didn't do too much, but, uh, you know, they, 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 a couple of them were kind of interested in Jesus. I was like, this guy's goofy, so I'm just going to be goofy back, you know? Like, what do you th- You know who I'm talking about, don't you? (laughs) All right, so so these two trees, tree of life, knowledge of good and evil. They're in the midst of the garden. Don't eat that one. This one you can have and any of the other ones. So the serpent says, you will not die. In fact, your eyes will be open and you will be like gods. Interesting that your eyes will be open. He didn't really tell them what that meant. Because they did, they got to see all the stuff that God never wanted them to see. The reality is God's trying to take you back into Eden and get you eating on the right tree and getting you to know your new creation so you'll stop seeing what they saw. So you'll stop saying, I'm naked. You're not naked anymore. You've been covered. Boaz has covered the building. Jesus has covered this place in his blood, and it speaks a better word than any animals. He's paid the price for you to live a life that is completely full of joy, completely full of peace, 
com- we could go down the fruits of the spirit, but the reality is that's just the beginning. Having your inside, your inward man full and knowing in your mind, oh my gosh, I'm getting the overflow of this stuff. I'm getting like joy overflow and it feels so good. I'm getting like peace overflow and it feels so good. You don't really understand your spirit man necessarily as you're learning him. You're going to know like all these things that are bubbling out of me are from this amazing place that God created in me. That's why sometimes we call it the river of life. We call it, it, it bubbles up. It's way down, and we need to get to know. We get to get, need to get to know who God has made us, who God knew, who God knew. See, God doesn't know the David you know, and God doesn't know the David I know. God for, knows the David he foreknew, and he's constantly saying, I know this David. Don't worry, you'll be there soon. And he's at the end, declaring the end from the beginning, saying, this is the David I know. You're going to get here. The the transition's up to me. You know, I can go the 40-year route, the 40-day route. You know, I I think the math's pretty simple, but some people like the 40-year route. In fact, some people just don't want to go over the promised land. It's kind of scary. You don't know what really is going to go on there. So how about we just do me? That's, the, that's all I want for people's life. It's just to taste and see. That's all I want. I, I don't really taste and see that the Lord is good. I want you to just know how good this God is. That you actually have been granted privilege to be his heir. And joint heir in Christ Jesus. This is an amazing promise. So here's these two trees. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil opened their eyes. They realized they were naked. The serpent said their eyes would be opened. They didn't know it would be opened to their miserable failures. They didn't realize that the enemy, the same enemy that's tempting you, is going to be stabbing you in the back as soon as you fall for the plot that he laid out. The trap is laid by the fowler, and you're like, oh, it'll be okay. I'm not surely going to die. Whoa. And then he's like, he's the one sticking you. See, I told you, God, he's worthless. He's never going to. And I'm like, that's terrible. Like, you act like you're friends. You're getting me the inside scoop to the tree. You're telling me what's up with the tree, and God was trying to sneak something over on me, and now I don't have it, but now I can get it because you told me. And then as soon as I fall for that thing, the enemy's right there uh, causing accusation against me. Because you know what he's trying to do? And this is where the cross comes in. He's trying to prevent you from entering and building that relationship with your new creation. He's trying to get you to a place of shame and guilt. And we can take it all the way to the other side where the Pharisees live. Because some of you would never do that stuff. And that's good. But how do you look at the ones that do? Because I'm good with, like, I'm good with living a, a real moral life. Freddie, you remember when I used to yell at Tracy, like, have, like, fits of rage because she wouldn't put on her seatbelt? <laughs> He's, like, 10 years old, and she's driving over 55. Do you remember that, too? I know you do. <laughs> You're driving over 55? What's wrong with you? You're sinning. And I don't even see the horrible person I am trying to put on this Pharisee costume that don't fit me at all. Thankfully, it was a long time ago. I mean, it was 18, 20 years. Thank you, Jesus. But I know you're happy about that. (laughs) So these two two trees, here's, here's, here's here's the last line. In Genesis 3, 22, God meets with Adam. You know the story. He actually creates a sheepskin. He wraps them up in a, in a skin, and he covers them. And it, if you, in typecasting, that's literally like Jesus, right? God takes a ram. He, he puts the skin over his children, and he covers them. The same way Jacob goes into his dad and says, don't I feel like Esau? We walk into the throne room, and Here's the thing we have to be careful, and this is, what I, this is what messed me up the most in my whole life, is I used to walk into the, into the throne room, 
saying I wasn't worthy, I got the sheepskin on. And then after I got enough religion under my belt, I would say, look how long I've done this. And look how much I've done. And look how much I gave. And look how much I fasted. Look how much I prayed. And God's like, I don't even know you. Like, he doesn't even talk to that guy. That guy he doesn't know. That's not the David he knows. The David he knows is tender. The David he knows, the, the you he knows is very connected. And the mind is trying to tell you who you are, and it doesn't even have a clue. Because until your mind's renewed and you get the mind and you put on the mind of Christ, you won't have access to your spirit man. So let's all stand to our feet. I'm going to share this. This this is the last point. So in the cross, in the cross, okay, you have the cross, and it has made all the provision for you, the cross, right? Jesus has made the whole way straight for you. Like, literally, all you have to do is say, I'm taking a walk. I'm walking the line. And God's saying, I already made this perfect for you. I already made this perfectly straight for you. And something in man always is looking for the, is that person doing good or is that person doing evil? Is that, am I doing good or am I doing evil? And actually both are just as bad. Here's the, here's the kicker. Your goodness will get you just as kicked out of the garden as your evil. And when your goodness is your goodness, you're disqualified. I played that game a long time, and I started feeling really good, and I didn't even realize I was on the biggest ego trip of my life. And then I had to, like, I got destroyed by God because you can't live out in that place for long if you're really, if you're really his because you're not made for that. He says this. I see, we see that they've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and now they're like us. If they eat from the tree of life, they will never die. Jesus went to the cross to swallow that tree. Jesus went to the cross to swallow that tree whole. Good and evil has to re be removed from your understanding. And you have to get to a place where your life is lived, eating from the tree of life, which is the love of God. Like, literally, I live and I make my decisions because I love God. That's it. The simplicity of that would revolutionize people's lives. I want to live a life just because he lives. Just because he's paid the price. I just want to love him back. And keep it that simple. If we could do that, we will change the world. We will change this region. We will change our homes. We will change our families. Because we won't be looking at, are you doing good? Are you doing evil? I'll start saying, I need to love her into the place where love can fill that space. Because it's no longer about good or evil. I won't look down on people that are doing evil. I won't look uh, up to people that are doing good and not feel good enough. It, all that stuff's removed. All that stuff's gone. That self-focused stuff. And so the cross is an amazing display of living for love. Living the beauty of who God made us. So I just feel there's some people in here today that you understand. And I, I even know that is there, I guess I should ask first, is there anyone in here? I would ask for every head bow, eyes closed, and all that. I, I like what Steve Hill used to say when I went to Brownsville. He said, Jesus hung naked on a tree. If you're ashamed of him, he says, I'll be ashamed of you. That's another American thing we got to throw away. That's bad thinking. Jesus is like, if you're not standing in my army, if you're not representing me, I don't know you. That's heavy. That's his reality. So getting that foundation will make us solid 
and it will make us stand. It will make us impervious to the attack of the enemy because there won't be any darkness left in us. So is there anyone in this room that you could say, I don't know Jesus? Anyone in the room? Do you want to raise your hand? Okay, awesome. Well, it's not awesome, actually. We want to bring lots of people that don't know Jesus. We want to we want to go out on the streets and get people to know Jesus. It was awesome to get the, that guy to accept Jesus yesterday at the, at the car dealership. And he was so sincere. The guy believed he wasn't worthy to ever not go to hell. He said, I'm too far gone. He's like 40 years old. How can you be too far gone? You're too young. You got kids, little kids. When people believe stuff, we're sent to destroy the works of darkness, the lies Simple stuff. Yeah, he'll be coming. And so, I feel like the main thing that I was going to call for, but I always want to make sure salvation's covered. Who in here, you could say that I've been really in a place where I've been carnally minded and struggling. And there's no shame in this because the reality is when we can, can admit then the Lord can actually give us grace. So if that's you, can you raise your hand? Just keep your hand nice and high like that. God, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord, for every hand raised. And I ask, Lord, that you would sweep through this place. You would destroy everything that has created darkness. If you see uh, someone near you with their hand raised, just put your hand on their shoulder. And I pray that we become people that start praying when we see people struggle. Start calling and start loving. We pray right now and we just release the grace of God over this room. And we thank you, Lord, that you're calling us up higher. We thank you, Lord, you're removing all excuses. And, Lord, it's not just, it's not even something we're going to work. It's going to be the work that you've worked. It's going to be the cross that you've paid for. The mystery of the cross is that while I was dead in sin and trespasses, not only did you die from the foundation of the world, planned, God, you destroyed the works of darkness. So, Lord, we just ask that every mind understand you're a good daddy. You're an amazing God. You're a powerful God. And there is no place. There is no place for darkness in us. So every place, Lord, we challenge it. We challenge it to the high calling in Christ Jesus. I pray that none would fall away. I pray that all should be saved. None shall perish, but all shall come to repentance. I pray against, against any self-destructive nature. I pray against those that that don't understand and the enemies has, has, has trapped their mind, Lord, that they would reach out and that we would be able to keep them, keep them out of that place, Lord, because of love. It is finished. It is finished. Here's the deal, guys. Everybody look this way. We're, cru we're crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I live, I now live for the only begotten of the Father. The life you've been given is the life of Christ. The life that he lived, the life that you read about is the life that you've been given. You're not given your life. You told him you gave him yours. And he said, I give you mine. The life that you read about in the Gospels has been given to you to walk it out. And that amazing... so. We're co-crucified with Christ so we can be co-raised with him as heirs and sons and empowered ones. So we completely transform our mind because of the power of his love, because of the power of what he's done. And so I just challenge you, rather, you, if you keep looking at that tree, just burn that thing. Every time you have a thought, take that thought captive, trash it, constantly just clean out the closet of your mind and just watch the Lord do this thing. It will be amazing because this is what he's paid for. This is what's yours. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise?
Thank you guys so much. Tracy, uh, I, I just want to make sure everybody knows uh, Roy and Darlene are going to be speaking at 2.30, well, at the 2.30 service, and the House of Levi will be back.